Thank you all for joining us for our second talk in our Learn to Discern Fall 2021 webinar series, Confronting a Climate Change. We will get started if you'll just make sure that your mics are and cameras are off. I am Kimberly Cox. I am an instructor in the government department at TCC Connect, and I'll be the moderator. And our presenter today is Misty Wilson Mertens, our department chair of social sciences at Connect. And to start this off, Misty, I'm going to ask you how long have we known that humans have had an impact on the environment? And do you have specific examples you can give us? So thank you first off for that introduction. And yeah, we've known this for a really, really long time. Uh, we've known for at least 5,000 years that humans can and do impact the environment in which they live on. And that that impact can be either for positive or for negative. So we know from the Indus civilization, which would be in modern day Pakistan, that we had already started seeing um, effects of pollution about 5,000 years ago. Greek philosophers and Romans were talking about deforestation and soil erosion. We have communities in China, India, and Peru that are all doing crop rotation and soil recycling. And then in the Americas, there are the Iroquois. And the Iroquois have this philosophy called the seventh generation. So this is an idea that all of our tribal decisions should consider the effects of the actions seven generations into the future. And um, what you're seeing here in this image is a sculpture from Boulder Hot Springs in Colorado. And you're seeing, if you look at you know this image, seven generations into the future, what we do now is going to impact them. So this idea of climate change or um, us affecting the environment, none of this is new. We've known this for a really, really long time. And I know that's true. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the Cherokee tribe, and I know that they're, they have worked really hard with the U.S. government in implementing environmental policies for the tribal land. But if you look even in early America, um, I know that land was important in early America because we're an agricultural based economy. Did the new settlers recognize the impacts? Absolutely. So even if we go back to our colonial government, we are seeing um, early laws passed and groups formed that are about protecting the environment. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, if you want to go into New England history, there's a lot more I could talk about. But I pick kind of the top ones. Um, so Pennsylvania is a colony set up by William Penn and Governor Penn orders that for every five acres of trees you cleared, you have to preserve one acre. So this idea that we cannot just completely deforest, um, that's an idea that's coming over from England because they had had some severe deforestation and they are starting to realize that that had a chain effect on the animals and then of course the hunting and then that means a food source for people. So we're seeing these really early laws passed. If you clear five acres, you got to keep one acre. Um, I know that we all think of Benjamin Franklin as like the guy with the key and the kite, right? Uh, but Ben Franklin's also an early environmentalist. So he has a pretty extensive career trying to work on water pollution. Um, and his concern is Philadelphia. So he's noticing that the water is contaminated. That's leading to all sorts of diseases, including yellow fever. And he was getting pushback from some groups that talked about their private right, their private right to dispose of waste into the river. And his argument back is, you know, there's private rights, but there's also public rights. And so as the public, we have a right to clean drinking water that won't make us sick. Um, when he dies, he leaves money in his will to create a new water system in Philadelphia. 
that's going to deliver clean water. Um, that takes decades, but we have that early idea built in. And yeah, it's because Philadelphia is doing it, other towns start doing it. Yeah, I think it's always interesting because you there's there's this book called Founding Gardeners that I read, which talks about the founding fathers and how into the environment they are. And I think that's something a lot of people miss in this early American environmental movement. But it, it looking forward, is are there any industries that are having an impact even early on? Yes. So I don't want to paint too rosy a picture with Ben Franklin, right? Um, he is reacting to issues he was seeing. And just like Ben Franklin, we're going to see a reaction to other issues as they come up in American history. So one of the first things that we talk about with environmentalists is extinction events. And from 1600 to 1900, there are a lot of extinction events that occur in the United States. The one that I think we're probably most familiar with is the almost extinction of the buffalo. I think at one point, buffalo get down to, we had, what, 30 left out of the entire millions that had existed. And what you're seeing here in this image is buffalo skulls. Those are just skulls from buffalo hunts. So if you can imagine, each one of those represents its own unique animal. You can see what overhunting was doing. Um, in a similar way, there is overfishing and there's whaling. Um, I know that we don't think about the United States as being a country that depended on whale products, but really up until the 1900s, we did. Um, we consumed 30% of all whale products in the, United, in the world. When we start to um, get into factories, we're using coal as a source of um, power and for steamships, trains. So coal burning becomes a real problem. As we're moving further west, uh, we have deforestation. And then the Industrial Revolution is going to give us all sorts of pollution from, again, coal, but also from metal, from chemicals, overcrowding, um, contaminating our water sources. So as we see all of these issues popping up, there are reactions to them. And I will say most of our early interventions do tend to be reactionary. So you are concerned about whaling or you are concerned about deforestation, but we didn't have a whole lot of people that put those together into a bigger movement called environmentalism quite yet. So when when do we see the, like a true beginning of, a, of a, a real conservative movement in the United States? By the mid 1800s, we have the pieces that we're gonna start building that with. And this goes through essentially three ideologies to get us to the modern idea of what environmentalism means. Um, so the early one is utilitarian. So there is this idea that we should conserve our resources because we need resources. We don't want to overfish because then we won't have any fish. So this is a really basic understanding of what it means to be involved in conservation. Um, but it also is a fairly limited view because we're not really seeing the bigger picture, right? We're looking at each resource as its own individual thing, and we're not seeing the interconnections that are happening. By the mid-1800s, we are going to shift, um, and this is partly due to these two movements that develop side by side, romanticism and transcendental transcendentalism. I can never say that word. Um, so the American Romantic Movement you guys are probably familiar if you've taken an English class of um, Ralph Waldo Emerson or Henry David Thoreau, who's the picture that's up there. They're writing about nature, about the wilderness and comparing that to the human spirit. Um, they also start to talk about how this land is a personified Americanness. So the West is rugged, it's untamed, it's wild, just like people that move out West, right? Same thing. So we're conflating our identity with our land. And then as we move forward, that moves into our art. Um, so this is a painting by Thomas Cole. And you're seeing, again, that landscape. Um, it's really an American landscape, right? There's nowhere in Europe that looks quite like that. That is very much an image of our country. So if we have this romanticism about what our land means, then we should try to protect it. Um, the Romantics are very concerned about over-commercialization 
and about tourism becoming too much of an influence, um, especially in places on the East Coast like Niagara. They don't want that to become polluted, I guess is the right word, by too many people coming to visit. And then as we get more and more west, they start to become concerned about places like the Grand Canyon. We don't want that to become just a tourist stop. We want it to hold its meaning. And then finally, towards the end of the 1800s, we are going to get into ecological conservation. And this is where we really, for the first time, start to see that the land is connected to species. Species are interconnected to each other. So if you cut down all the trees, you affect the animals. The animals then cannot eat the correct fish. Too many of one kind of fish are going to survive. They're going to overpopulate in a river. Everything is connected. This is more of our modern understanding of um, like habitats and how they work. This comes from George Perkins Marsh. He is going to write several books that are important, um, but the big one he's going to talk about is just how humans modify the land. Our actions have consequences. So we need to think things through. And it's so interesting, I think, you know, I don't know what you think. I'm a, I know I'm throwing out a question here, but, you know, looking at literature and art at this point in time, I mean, we didn't have the internet or TV or radio. So this is the way people are communicating about this issue. So I, I think it's so fascinating. Um, I, I don't know. But, it, and also too, I'll put a plug in for the Eamon Carter Museum. They have a Thomas Cole painting that's very similar to the one you have. And it is an advertisement basically for move out west it's great but in all this land and everything so um but i mean looking forward i think the next year is probably the progressive era and also looking at the national parks system how big of a deal is all all of that as a combination moving forward from the uh, the previous movement so by the late 1800s going into the turn of the century the progressive era not just with the environment, but with lots of issues, we come to believe that we can solve problems through science and understanding. So if you put together enough evidence and data, you can figure out what the exact problem is, you can work to solve it, and then you can use the government as a way to solve your problems. So the progressives are going to take that philosophy and they do it in education and social reforms and then also the environment. So this is a little bit disjointed because these groups are not all working together. But we start to see several groups that form all about this idea about conserving our environment and protecting our environment. So one of the earliest is in 1890, the General Federation of Women's Clubs is formed and they put conservation as one of their top priorities. So these are upper middle class elite women who are worried about the environment, protecting it, and keeping it safe for their children. And they're particularly going to focus on forests, waterways, and rivers. And they are going to try to promote clean water, clean transportation, and basically want to preserve the land so that their children will know the same country that they knew. Keeping on that same idea, in 1892, we have John Muir, who's going to found the Sierra Club. We call him the father of the national parks because his writing and his activism is eventually gonna give us several of our early national parks. And he's a huge influence on Teddy Roosevelt, who you see here. So these are these two men in a picture together, early, early, early national park system. Teddy Roosevelt becomes our president in 1902 after William McKinley is assassinated. Roosevelt is not well liked by his own party. So he has to find avenues to connect with the common people to get us to support him. So even if his party doesn't like him, he can win the presidential um, election in his own right. And so one of the things that he's going to connect with people on is his love of the outdoors and the environment. So in his first annual message to Congress, he is going to outline his goals. And one of them is conservation and preservation of natural lands. He says that the government has a role here. He's really our first president that talks about how the government should play a part in protecting the land that we have. Um, so Theodore Roosevelt is going to create 230 million acres of public land, which eventually helps to create our national park system. He also creates a federal bird reserve. And eventually that's going to turn into one of our many national wildlife refugees. 
And um, he is going to essentially set us up for this being part of our national conversation. By the time he leaves office, he's going to hold a international conference, the North American Conservation Conference, and it's attended by representatives of Canada, Newfoundland, Mexico, and the United States. This is the third of these conferences he held. Uh, the first two were domestic. The third was international. He has plans for a fourth one. It's supposed to be held in September of 1909. 30 nations agree to go. This is going to be a global movement. It's going to be a big deal. But Roosevelt doesn't run for a third term, and his successor, William Howard Taft, decides to cancel the conference, so it never happens. This is a huge push early on, and then when Roosevelt leaves, it just kind of falls apart. So all these, if if you watch any of the old reels of these guys out there, I call it glamping because they always they have cars, yes. and they bring all their stuff to glamp out on, you know. So this big movement just dies. Um, I mean, so I know in this one, in this particular section, they're looking at conservation of land and, you know, forests and water. But at some point, I mean, we do get a change and they're looking more at industry and chemical pollution. When does all that, when does that start to happen? So once Roosevelt leaves, we see the federal government pull back a bit and this becomes more state and local level, um, with the exception being the New Deal. But that becomes more of a jobs program than really, truly conservation. But in the 1960s, we see the federal government re-enter the conversation. And we have one woman to thank for that, and that's going to be Rachel Carson. She's going to publish a book called Silent Spring. So Silent Spring is number five on Random House's Modern Library's 100 Best Nonfiction Books of the 20th Century. It's in Discover Magazine's top 25 science books of all time. The Guardian listed it in 2010 as one of the 50 books that changed the world. And in 2011, Time Magazine puts it in the top 100 all-time most important nonfiction books. This book is a big deal. Carson is a marine biologist. And what she's doing in this book is documenting all of the adverse effects that she's seeing from the use of pesticides. Um, she really sets off this conversation about the chemicals we're using, why we're using them, is it safe to be using them, what are the unintended consequences of using them. Um, DDT is one of the chemicals she's very critical about. This book is such a big deal that by 1975, every single chemical she mentioned in the book that she labels as toxic is either banned or severely restricted. So this book is really, really resonating with the American population. The same year she publishes this book, we are going to have the first White House uh, uh, conference on con conservation since 1908. So President Kennedy, reading the public opinion, sees that people care about this and are very concerned about this. And he's going to make sure the federal government responds. He says that conservation has to become part of our domestic and our foreign policy. And that it's important for us to protect our natural resources for our country's long-term economic growth. So this isn't just an environmental policy. It's an investment in our country to make sure that we have these resources and we can continue to use them. And I think too, it's it's you know interesting to see someone like Rachel Carson have such an impact because we think we as individuals sometimes our voices don't matter, but they do through literature and art and even you know other examples. Do you have any other examples of this? I sure do. So in the 1960s, um, truly, this is a national conversation we're having to the point where it becomes satire. So I'm going to show you guys an early pop culture reference uh, to pollution. This is Tom Lear. He's uh, singing a song on a television show. The show is called That Was the Week That Was. Um, it's sort of like a variety show, um, a little bit like Saturday Night Live kind of sketch show. And we're not going to watch the whole thing, but I want you guys just to get a feel for how this conversation is going. American city, you will find it very pretty. 
just two things of which you must beware. Don't drink the water and don't breathe the air. Pollution, pollution, we got smog and sewage and mud. Turn on your tap and get hot and cold running crud. So if you guys want to find the rest of it, it's on YouTube. Feel free. But it kind so of goes really on positive like that. then. <laughs> Yes, super positive. <laughs> super positive about it. But he's saying it in a way that it's a joke, so it's clearly understood, right? We all know what he's talking about, or else he would have to explain it more in depth. Yeah, I mean, the fact that the satire that they get, you know, definitely. <laughs> I think that's one of the fun things about watching political satire is it's it's funnier sometimes because everybody gets it in a in this uh, instance, a sad way. Um, right. And so Earth Day, does, does Earth Day matter? What's going on with Earth Day? <laughs> so um, our first national celebration of Earth Day is in 1970. Um, this starts a year earlier in 1969 in San Francisco. This actually begins as part of a, a peace activist who decides that there's going to be a way to combine environmentalism with peace. And so he's going to plan this... Um, March, I guess you would say, in San Francisco for March of 1970. It's going to be on the first day of spring. And again, it's trying to tie those two ideas together. There is a senator, Gaylord Nelson, who decides that that needs to be a national thing, not a local thing. And so he is going to propose that we move it to April of 1970 and that we rename it Earth Day. So he's going to hire a staff and they are going to originally plan a teach-in, which is a thing that happened in the 1960s and 70s um, across college campuses, but it grew from there. And by the time we actually get to the first Earth Day, again, April 22nd, 1970, this is a massive demonstration in cities across the country. Um, we have rough estimates, about 20 million people that went out to march in preparation and in support of Earth Day. Even till today, this is the single largest protest in human history we've ever seen. So, I mean, if you're having these huge marches happening, is the government taking notice? Are they doing anything at this point in time? Are they actually implementing any real legislation? So before we get to the government, I think it's important to talk about what the news media says, because the news media That's does true. to some extent drive our conversations. So I have for you guys a video of Walter Cronkite. Um, Walter Cronkite is the most trusted man in America. He is the man who broke every major news story in the mid 20th century. He is going to give us a news report on what happened during Earth Day. I want to play this for you guys because I want you to notice two things. First, I want you to see just how dismissive the tone is. I mean, this is the largest demonstration we've ever had in human history. And yet, the way he talks about it, it's like it's kind of nothing. And then I also want you guys to hear how he talks about young people, because that has not changed. This planet is threatened with destruction, and we who live in it with death. The heavens reek. The waters below are foul, children die in infancy, and we and the world, which is our home, live on the brink of nuclear annihilation. We are in a crisis of survival. This is a CBS News special, Earth Day, a question of survival, with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good evening. A unique day in American history is ending, a day set aside for a nationwide outpouring of mankind seeking its own survival. Earth Day, a day dedicated to enlisting all the citizens of a bountiful country in the common cause of saving life from the deadly byproducts of that bounty, the fouled skies, the filthy waters, the littered earth. As a demonstration, its success was mixed, beyond expectations here, far below there. No one now can know exactly how many took part. We do have an idea how many planned participation. Student groups in 2,000 colleges and 10,000 lower schools, citizen groups in 2,000 communities. By one measurement, Earth Day failed. It did not unite. It did attract that broad cross-section of America its sponsors wanted, not quite. 
Its demonstrators were predominantly young, predominantly white, predominantly anti-Nixon. Often its protests appeared frivolous, its protesters curiously carefree. Yet the gravity of the message of Earth Day still came through. Act or die. We begin our report with Bruce Morton in Denver. Place for Purple Mountain's majesty. A place where, on a clear day, the legend says you could see forever. The clear days are fewer now. And instead of forever, the view often stops with haze. Next to Los Angeles, Denver has the best climate in the country for producing smog. In this unlikely seeming place, the air is threatened. Earth Day is a focus for efforts to save it. Bicycles at the state capitol were a Denver symbol. Auto pollution is a major problem here in the country's 17th most polluted city, so high schoolers pedal to show there's another way to travel. The altitude increases car engines' pollution output. It doesn't do a thing to bikes. Somebody in the cheerful, disorganized crowd said, let's clean up, and the several hundred young people did, scouring the capitol grounds for litter. Cleanups like this went on in many parts of Denver today. Somebody got a wastebasket from the Capitol and said it must be the only one, but there were enough paper bags to go around. Then they left for the teach-in, bikers on bikes, but hundreds of others traveling on foot. Some sang, some shouted, all seemed to enjoy the day. High schools were not closed, but many announced absences would be excused. Kerrigan Plaza, the hall, was arranged to seat 6,000, though some planners predicted a half-full house. In fact, it was better than that. Lots of coming and going, but about 5,000 seats filled. Most were young, but not all. Most were white, but not all. A group who'd bicycled across the state gave Governor John Love a declaration supporting a cleaner planet, and the governor signed it. I, I love how they describe them as cheerful and disorganized youth protesters. <laughs> right. And they're just, oh, they were cleaning up. Look at those little kids. Yeah. Cleaning up. That got was a, the got whole a, point. Got a waste, you know, basket. That's it. I, you know, and it, I guess it, it begs the question, you know, were, were there some serious action on this or, or what? Or was everybody dismissive? What, what was the dichotomy at this point? So I think when Earth Day's over, and we actually get a tally of how many people participated. The government cannot ignore that many people. And so the attitude reverses very quickly. So under Richard Nixon, we see a real push for lots of change. Um, Earth Day occurred in April of 1970. By December of 1970, we have the creation of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. That's very quick change for the federal government. Very rarely do things move that fast. Um, the leader of the EPA is going to be, I'm going to say his name wrong. I'm sorry, guys. Walter Hickel. It's H-I-C-K-E-L, Walter Hickel. Um, he's the former governor of Alaska. And he really takes his job at the EPA very, very, very seriously. Um, so during his two years there, he is going to work on Everglades preservation, um, delaying the Alaska oil pipeline. He's going to crack down on oil companies in the Gulf of Mexico. He stops U.S. whaling. And he actually files a lawsuit, actually several lawsuits, against companies that are polluting the water. So he's very effective in his role. Um, probably a little too effective because he ends up getting fired by Richard Nixon. Nixon thinks he's moving too far too fast. Also under Nixon, though, we get the Clean Air Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act. So there is movement at the federal government level to really get involved in environmental protection. And I also like to point out this is under a Republican administration. Yeah, and, and I know because when I did the previous talk uh, looking at Nixon, there was almost like this... Um struggle between economic progress and environmental it seemed like the two could not work together which we see some of that today which we can talk about later but you know this this idea that you have to have one or the other and i was curious to you know look at this you talk about the um and more i guess the the case is coming through and this little guy what is this picture of <laughs> what's so going on this is a very very tiny little fish called a snail darter this is a little fish that lives in the Tennessee River Valley. So there was an attempt to build a dam 
on the Tennessee River Valley. Um, not the TVA that we all know and think of from the New Deal, a different one, a different dam. Um, but in 1973, this little tiny fish had been put on the Endangered Species Act. So according to the way that, that act was written, this dam can't be built because it would threaten this endangered species. Um, this is going to go all the way up to the Supreme Court. And then in 1976, uh, sorry, 1977, the court is going to say that Congress has a clear intent to halt and reverse the trend towards species extinction, whatever the cost. So even though they had already started building the dam, even though they had already spent about $80 million on it, they had to stop. Um, that is seen as a huge victory for the environmental movement, right? But it also was mocked pretty severely. Oh, look, this tiny little fish cost us $80 million. So in 1978, Congress actually went into the Endangered Species Act and amended it so that the dam could still get built. Um, and as a side note, um, the fish actually survived in, in 2019. It's no longer considered endangered. So, so I guess it worked out for both parties. Yeah. So I guess they both survived, but it definitely shows that struggle between the environmental movement and, and infrastructure and economy, which is, I think, just again that fight that we're always seeing happen uh, yes. does this does this movement pick up steam at any point and go global or is it just i mean do we ever get involved beyond our borders because i think with climate change we're looking at especially today it's not just us it's everybody so in the 1990s this really is a global international movement but it's also a really popular domestic movement in 1990 gallup poll found that 70 percent of americans called themselves environmentalists this was somewhat settled in the 1990, early 1990s. We um, kind of thought, yeah, of course we need to protect our environment. Of course there are things that are challenging that. We need to work together as Americans, but also across borders to make sure that this is going to continue to be an earth we can live on. In 1992, we have the Earth Summit in Rio de, Rio de Janeiro. And um, governments came together to agree on this basic framework for how to fight climate change. So um, the big thing that worked for Kusan at this point is greenhouse gases. We're going to try to limit the amount of greenhouse gas and the effects of it. In 1995, um, we have people saying that environmentalism is the most successful contemporary movement in all of the United States and Western Europe. That it was so successful, it's just settled and all governments are gonna follow these policies now. And you kind of wish, right? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> It'd be much easier now if it were done. Right? Yeah. Did, so what happened, right? Yeah, what happens? <laughs> I, um, I mean, this is great because, okay, we got to change hearts and minds and we got to start with kids, right? I'm guessing. Yeah. So it, to me, when we start teaching kids about something, we don't teach our children controversial things. We teach them things that we can all basically agree on and that are settled. So in the 1990s, we thought this was such a done deal that there are whole cartoons aimed at just general audience children that are about protecting the Earth. And the big one is Captain Planet, which one of my students told me there's going to be a live action Captain Planet. I didn't go look that up because I, have to I, look it up. <laughs> I would think it'd be a little creepy, but one of my students says it's coming. Um, but Bill Nye had episodes about the environment. Magic School Bus did. There's a movie called Fern Gully about the rainforest. And um, there's a Dr. Seuss book, The Lorax. It seemed I, so uncontroversial that we're teaching children about it. Yeah, and I'm old enough, I'll date myself, that I've seen all these and remember them from my childhood. And I think they did have an impact, at least on me. So I'll just put that out there. I remember Captain Planet. Not very well, but like vaguely I remember it. So, so what it... Yeah, global warming versus climate change. And and I'm curious, too, if you have any background on the difference between the two. Or are they the same thing, different names? So what happened and why this whole thing kind of fell apart starts with this graph. Um, this is a pretty infamous graph. It's called the hockey stick graph. It was released in 1998. It is put together by some climatologists. And what they're showing here or what they're trying to show here is that if you look at the late 1900s 
there is a rapid rise in temperature. I think, again, this is pretty settled science now, but at the time when this is released, if you look at the um, outliers on this graph, there's enough variables that lay people, common people, were not understanding what this graph was trying to show. And so some people looked at this graph and thought it showed, okay, the climate always varies. And sometimes it's high and sometimes it's low. Other people looked at it and said, well, okay, you're saying that temperatures are rising, but I'm not feeling that. I don't see that in the place I live. So we suffered here partly from bad PR. The original term used was global warming. But not every place does warm exactly the same way. Um, if you guys remember Snowpocalypse from last year, right? Yes. <laughs> there's Very much so. There's climate change that is a result of warming across the globe. But not every place is going to have the exact same outcome. Not every place is going to end up looking like Miami, right? So... Really, um, there's this shift now to use climate change rather than the term global warming, because one, it is more accurate, and two, people can understand it better. We can wrap our heads around climate change, whereas uh, warming, maybe not so much, especially if where you specifically live is not getting warmer. Yeah, and I think they needed a better messenger than Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, too, at the time when all this was first coming out. I'll just yes. put that out there. Not yes. the most exciting pre presenter out there. So, yeah, just And um, There just are some it. sociologists that have looked at this that said another problem is that scientists are used to speaking to other scientists, but they don't know how to communicate these messages to common people very well. And so they're putting out good information, but we're not understanding it. So we need better marketing then. <laughs> yes, they needed marketing help and they weren't getting it. So in today's world, the science here is actually pretty settled. Um, now we have this shift to something we call post-environmentalism, which is this idea that we need to kind of go back to the basics, go back to those ideas of the Sierra, the Sierra Club had. Um, everything is interconnected. If one part of our environment fails, another part is likely to fail. We need to see this holistically. Um, but also, we've moved beyond science. Now let's go to politics. We need to start pressuring our politicians to help us achieve the results we want. So if the result we want is less climate change, well, then we are going to have to put policies in place that get us there. And that means voting for the people that will enact those policies, whether or not they are comfortable, right? Because some of this is going to be uncomfortable. Yeah, it's going to put pressure on a lot of different industries and just, I mean, governments, local governments, they're going to get pushed back. So it, it's for not sure. going to be easy. Yeah. Um, looking at our, oh, and I wanted to give you guys this link here. Um, if you are somebody who likes a lot of data, Yale has been doing these maps about climate change, which I think are very interesting. And you can kind of track um, public understanding and uh, public opinion on this issue using these maps. So again, if you're a data nerd, go look at that. It's really interesting. All right, so um, some more data that I thought was super interesting. If you look at May of 1989, 70 6% of Americans say that they are environmentalist. Today, only 41% of us would say that we are environmentalist. But more of us are concerned about the environment. 39% uh, of us think that the effects of climate change and global warming are generally underestimated and that we should be more concerned than we are. So we're at a high, a peak of being concerned but fewer of us call ourselves environmentalists than we have in 40 years. It's such a strange disconnect, I guess. It really uh, that's is. just my opinion. I don't, I don't quite, other than, I know we talked about the, the politics of it, but I, it, it just doesn't make sense. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, so polls taken in the last year say that 62% of Americans say the government is doing far too little on the environment. 
A majority say we should prioritize the environment, even if it limits economic growth. And Americans are showing a strong support for curbing emissions and all and using alternative energy, even if it costs more money. So again, like our public opinion is not matching how we view ourselves. So I think maybe some of us need to go back to that uh, Rachel Carson idea and that you can change things. If this is really important to you, make it known that it's important to you. Put pressure on your politicians. And then really a lot of this is going to come down to Gen Z. I mean, I mean <laughs> I'm a millennial, so I'm passing the buck to you guys. But they're the ones that are going to have to take this ball and run with it, right? I, they're I the agree. ones that are going to see more of the effects. Yeah, it's going to be on them. They're the ones that are going to face all of the drought, the fires, the all the scary stuff that the IPCC the reports and all the snow, the, the ice. Yeah. Right. It's going to impact where they live, work, everything. Right. And, and where jobs are being created. Yeah. Eventually, this is all going to be interconnected. Again, going back to that idea from the Sierra Club. So interconnection and sell it better. <laughs> Get out there and everybody so do their part. <laughs> you take away nothing else. I want you to understand from a history perspective, none of this is new. Um, we've been doing this for a really, really, really long time. And we're probably going to have to keep doing it for a little bit longer. Yeah, at least until 2030 and 2050. I think those are the two cutoff points yeah. that are been out there right now, right? I'm, I might mm -hmm. be wrong. <laughs> um, so we have two more webinars in the series coming up. Uh, Lugger Davis Hanna is going to talk to us about the plastic industry in the middle of November. And then going back to that idea of like, what can I do? A bunch of professors are going to come together in December and talk about what our responsibilities are towards the climate and how we can help. And I'm looking, if anybody has any questions, um, you can place them in the chat. And I know it looks like um, Professor Mertens is uh, putting in the attendance form. Yeah, there it goes. So if you have any questions, let us know. We'll hang around. Um, be sure to fill out the attendance form to get credit that's sent out to your instructors. And we really appreciate you guys um, joining us today and hope that you'll join us at the um, last two seminars for fall 2021 on climate. And if there's a topic you would like to see addressed in the spring, um, let us know because we are actively working on building our spring webinar series. So if yeah. there's something you're interested in, please let us know. This climate change, this whole thing came from a student suggestion. Yeah, I think it's fun to talk about things and research things that the students are interested in. It makes it for sure. More, I, I don't know. Makes it more interesting for me. Ooh, okay. Here, um, Alicia says here is a great podcast episode that was interesting. Uh, has interesting information. Special edition climate crisis. Ooh, thank you. I will definitely check that out. Yeah, I, I like it too. If you guys, I know students are such a wealth of information because I, I, I agree that we've been talking about for a long time, but for young people, it's it's more present, if that makes sense. It's more concerning. So they often right. have good information on this. 